simply attractive girl. <laughs> what would you say if I told you she was the Spider Woman? The femme fatale is bold, beautiful, and bad to the bone. I'm a bad girl, Nicholas. Most associated with classic film noir of the 1940s and 50s, she earns her name. French for fatal woman because she traditionally brings about the destruction of the man or men in her story. You're not too smart, are you? <laughs> I like that in a man. Comparing the many mesmerizing iterations of the on screen femme fatale, we can identify some patterns that define her. She's magnetic, seductive, even irresistible. She often makes a sensational first impression. Hilda, are you decent? Me? immediately hooking the protagonist's and audience's attention. In fact, I'd hate to think of you are not uh, fully covered. She's a sexual being and wields her sexuality as a tool or a weapon to get what she wants. You know I don't wear any underwear, don't you, Nick? She has a cynical view of the world. Everything's bad, Michael. Everything. She wants money and likes material things. You've just made me a very rich woman. A master manipulatrix, she's hiding her true self. Help me. You won't need much of anybody's help. You're good. It's chiefly your eyes, I think, and that throb you get in your voice when you say things like, be generous, Mr. Spade. And despite the passion she inspires, she's emotionally very cold and distant. That's pretty cold, ain't it, lady? I'm a writer. I use people for what I write. Traditionally, she's not interested in being a mother or leading a conventional domestic life. At its core, the villainy of the femme fatale often exposes our culture's anxieties about females. You trust me now? Less now than when I didn't trust you before. Here's our take on the femme fatale through the ages, how she exposes which qualities in women make society uncomfortable, and what she looks like today. Anybody checked you for a heartbeat lately? You're watching The Take. Thanks for watching and be sure to share and subscribe. This video is brought to you by Sundance Now, a streaming service featuring prestige drama, intoxicating romances, international thrillers, bone chilling true crime, and so much more. Click the link in our description below, sundancenow.com, to get a free 30 day trial using the promo code The Take. Start watching something new today. Throughout her history, the femme fatale has been a reflection of her era's anxieties about femininity. Oh, you idiot! How can a man be so dumb? <laughs> I've wanted to laugh in your face ever since I first met you. Early versions of this trope, like Eve or Salome, are cautionary tales of the risks of unchecked female sexuality. Myth and literature are also filled with examples of the faithless woman whose betrayal undoes her man, like the biblical Delilah, who weakens Samson by having his hair cut off or Greek mythology's Clytemnestra, who plots with her lover to kill her husband, Agamemnon, in the bathtub when he returns from the Trojan War. The most influential early screen femme fatale was Theda Barra's vamp character in 1915's A Fool There Was, who helped solidify the popular conception of the seductress as an almost supernatural bloodsucker. The heyday of the femme fatale on screen came in film noir of the 1940s and 50s. I find men very attractive. I imagine they meet you halfway. During World War II, many women had been called away from traditional domestic roles to work to aid the war effort. And in the post-war era, the femme fatale was deeply linked to male fears that women had gained too much power and independence outside the home. As Richard Lingeman writes in the noir 40s, the rise of the femme fatale in films noir reflected male ambivalence and anxiety about those Amazons unleashed by the war who worked at men's jobs, had sex with whomever they wanted, and rejected home and motherhood. You like money. You got a great big dollar sign there where most women have a heart. Certain noir movies specifically reflected worries about women's fidelity, as returning soldiers wondered what their sweethearts had been up to while they were fighting overseas. Well, you haven't much faith in the stability of women then, have you, Johnny? This paranoid obsession with female faithlessness is central to 1946's Gilda. Sure, I'm decent. Which stars Rita Hayworth as a sex bomb who decides to make her ex Johnny jealous by parading around with various men. If I'd been a ranch, they would have named me the bar nothing. 
Johnny expresses intense hatred for Gilda. I hated her so I couldn't get her out of my mind for a minute. Which centers on his belief that she's been sleeping around, even though she's actually married to another man at the time. The plot culminates in Hayworth performing a strip tease to put the blame on Mame. Put the blame on Mame, boys. Whose lyrics tell of a sensual woman being blamed for all the world's major problems. And her dance confronts Johnny with the image of harlotry he's forced on her. Now they all know that the mighty Johnny Farrell got taken and that he married a. <laughs> it's only when Johnny is finally satisfied that Gilda isn't promiscuous after all that he finally stops punishing her and admits his love. Gilda didn't do any of those things you've been losing sleep over. Not any of them. Thus, fears of the unfaithful, loose woman were eased. Other examples of the femme fatale express a fear of the materialistic woman who lusts for wealth. Look at it. Fifties and twenties. There must be thousands here. Likely a manifestation of anxieties about women getting a taste for earning their own money during the war. Yes, and it's all mine too. I don't owe any payments on it. This character likes money, and more often than not, is revealed to be driven by a plot to enrich herself. Only why? I have four million reasons why. One of the most iconic femme fatales ever, Barbara Stanwyck's Phyllis Dietrichson in Double Indemnity, is not only taking out her husband for life insurance money, but it's also implied she murdered his first wife to land the guy back when he did have some wealth. She did it for the money. In 1945's Mildred Pierce, a rare early example where the trope is causing the ruin of a female protagonist, Joan Crawford's Mildred is tortured by her femme fatale daughter, Vita a young woman who's been spoiled rotten. You think new curtains are enough to make me happy? No, I want more than that. I want the kind of life that Monty taught me and you won't give it to me. Vita becomes a cautionary tale of what happens when you overindulge your children and get a young woman hooked on a decadent lifestyle. Money. That's what you live for, isn't it? You'd do anything for money, wouldn't you? Mildred Pierce also highlights post-war discomfort with the working woman. Vita resents and looks down on her mother for pursuing a career. Yeah, I can get away from you. From you and your chickens and your pies and your kitchens and everything that smells of grease. And while Mildred commands viewers respect for her hard work, one interpretation of the film is that it's showing all of Mildred's troubles as stemming from her decision to become a career woman. You look down on me because I work for a living, don't you? Lingaman even writes in the noir 40s, Hollywood resorted to a noir plot to sell the post-war message that women belonged in the home, not in the factory, let alone in the boss's office, except as his loyal secretary. Later examples of the femme fatale have played even more overtly on our society's continuing discomfort with female ambition and the career woman. Nicole Kidman's Suzanne Stone in To Die For is so driven to pursue her dream job as a TV journalist that when her husband suggests she quit her career to start a family, I am not selling short what you're doing now. You know, the weather report stuff, which you're really good at. But let's face facts, it's a family. That's what I'm talking about, Suze. This triggers Suzanne's decision to have him killed. Larry said he would never stand in my way, whatever happened. But the word failure is not part of my vocabulary. You could also view Breaking Bad's Lydia Rodart Quayle as an update to this deadly working woman, driven by bottomless corporate greed. You wanna talk mess with me? You can't even get us a single barrel. Who said anything about barrels? I'm talking about an ocean of the stuff. In 1950's Sunset Boulevard, Gloria Swanson's femme fatale Norma Desmond brings out our culture's discomfort with the aging woman. Norma, you're a woman of 50. Now grow up. Which continues to be fueled by Hollywood's obsession with youth. An army of beauty experts invaded her house on Sunset Boulevard. She went through a merciless series of treatments. Older women are expected to gracefully fade into the background and give way to the young. So Norma's villainy and delusion stem in large part from her refusal to follow this unwritten rule. No one never leaves a star. That's what makes one a star. Often, the femme fatale might be contrasted with a sweet, innocent female character who represents wholesome, good womanhood. By the conclusion of the story, the male hero may end up respecting or caring more for this good woman, and feeling hatred or contempt for the femme fatale who once ensnared him. I guess that was the first time I ever thought about Phyllis that way. Dead, I mean. 
how it would be if she were dead. At the heart of the femme fatale depictions is a fear of female sexuality. Sex always made you stupid, ready to believe anything. <laughs> In the 1992 erotic thriller Basic Instinct, Sharon Stone's Catherine Trammell takes the pure sexuality of the femme fatale to a deadly extreme. He falls for the wrong woman. What happens? She kills him. It's significant that the character is often promiscuous. My advice is to sleep with as many people as possible. She's aware of the power of her sexuality and not afraid to use it. I'm crazy about you, baby. I'm crazy about you, Walter. And crucially, in most examples, she rejects being a mother and building a traditional family home. Do you regret it, not having children? Do you ever regret having them? Arguably, this is the character's original sin, and the fundamental reason she's so villainized, her will to be sexual without this leading to motherhood. Go find yourself a nice little cowgirl, make nice little cow babies, and leave me alone. Virginia M. Allen writes that a woman not bearing a man's child is, quote, an extreme form of destruction of the male, deprivation of his posterity, his immortality. Look at me. I hate the little beast. I wish it would die. And that the femme fatale herself comes out of the fear and desire experienced by men confronted with women who deny the right of men to control female sexuality. Maybe you shouldn't dress like that. This is a blouse and skirt. I don't know what you're talking about. You shouldn't wear that body. The femme fatale's drive to destroy men is often made incredibly literal. You're killing people. No, I'm killing boys. The femme fatale is frequently trying to kill her husband. Sometimes you wish he was dead. Perhaps I do. And you wish it was an accident. And you had that policy for $50,000. Is that it? Perhaps that too. But she also tends to destroy the hero from the inside by awakening something dark and dangerous within the protagonist. And I went to prison and I met parts of myself lurking inside of me that I didn't even know were in there. That means they paid double on certain accidents, the kind that almost never happened. I see. We're hitting it for the limit, baby. Fritz Lang's 1944 noir, Woman in the Window, ends with revealing its plot has all been its male protagonist's dream. Getting at how the femme fatale is in large part a presence in the man's subconscious. I thought you might be missing me. You know that I am. I, I can't trust you anymore. There are generally two endings for the classic femme fatale. One, she's redeemed or revealed to not really have been bad, and thus not a femme fatale deep down. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. So she's allowed to get a happy ending. But more often, we get ending number two. She's revealed to be rotten to the core. I'm rotten to the heart. I used you just as you said. And usually, she must be punished, generally with death or with jail. This time your daughter pays for her own mistake. Though this comeuppance for sins was mandated by the Hays Code in the classic noir era, examples of the femme fatale escaping consequences remained few and far between until the 90s on. Thus, whether it's through destroying her or through revealing her to be secretly decent, in most classic examples, and many to this day, the threat of the femme fatale is finally eliminated. You know, for a smart girl, you make a lot of mistakes. You're gonna need a good lawyer. And thus, male anxieties are purged. That means if you're a good girl, you'll be out in 20 years. I'll be waiting for you. If they hang you, I'll always remember you. One of the enduring questions about the femme fatale is whether this trope is misogynistic or feminist. She's the picture of female power and sexual liberation. But for this, she's vilified and taken down by her story. You do hate me, don't you, Johnny? I don't think you have any idea how much. The best answer to this debate is, really, that the femme fatale can be both sexist and empowering. Though the ending of her story usually condemns or eliminates her, in the majority of her screen time, she's portrayed as incredibly compelling. She tends to be the most iconic, memorable character in her story. You touch me and you won't live till morning. One way of viewing this trope, especially when we look back on older films, is that it allowed writers to create strong female characters who are smarter than everyone else around them, while also owning their sexuality and womanhood. In order for writers to do this, this character usually had to be reined in, so as not to feel too threatening to the status quo. Now you are dangerous. 
The femme fatale is also often portrayed as the victim of her society. This is seen in 1945's Detour, where the femme fatale isn't presented as alluring. You look just like a Phoenix girl. Are the girls in Phoenix that bad? This sick, down-and-out hitchhiker has had to fight off her share of bad men, which explains her bitter view of the world. Listen, mister, I've been around, and I know a wrong guy when I see one. In the 1974 neo-noir Chinatown, Evelyn Mulray, who starts out framed as the femme fatale, turns out to be not a villain at all, but a victim of the worst abuses imaginable. Ultimately, the femme fatale as victim illuminates how women like her are trapped in her society. Housewives can get awfully bored sometimes. Even the fact that the villainous examples of the trope are so often trying to get free of their husbands and achieve financial independence tells us how powerless they feel in their starting situations. I want to be somebody. While Phyllis is revealed to be lying about many things, her numerous comments about feeling stifled by her husband and married life still ring true. My husband never tells me anything. He keeps me on a leash so tight I can't breathe. Well, if he never lets me go anywhere, he keeps me shut up. He's always been mean to me. We can see this frustration with feeling trapped by stifling gender expectations driving much later femme fatales as well. God forbid I exude confidence and enjoy sex. Do you think I relish the fact that I have to act like Mary Sunshine 24-7 so I can be considered a lady? And the femme fatale's trademark dishonesty... I've always been a liar. It must really be something, making stuff up all the time. Yeah, it teaches you to lie. ...is encouraged by a society that would not accept the real her. I never told you I was anything but what I am. You just wanted to imagine I was. So, where is the femme fatale at today? Whereas in the past, the femme fatale tended to prey on men, more recent films and shows might show her leading another woman astray. I thought you only murdered boys. I go both ways. In the early seasons of Orange is the New Black, criminal Alex is painted as a femme fatale in a lesbian relationship, tempting protagonist Piper down a dark path. Alex, I was so freaked out when the bag didn't show up, I almost bailed. It's a good thing you didn't. It's over 50 grand in that bag. Cooper would have had you killed. But while the show spends a lot of time exploring dark influences, I don't like Alex. She put you in prison. She continues to make you suffer. It eventually sympathizes with Alex and frames Piper's relationship with Alex as flawed yet ultimately loving. In Paul Feig's A Simple Favor, Blake Lively's femme fatale Emily Nelson brings darkness into the life of a new female friend. Interestingly, A Simple Favor's femme fatale is a mother. Unlike the classic version of the trope who eschews motherhood. Mommy needs a drink. But A Simple Favor uses its update to the trope cleverly to expose what are still taboos and sore points for women today. You don't need to apologize. It's a f***ed up female habit. You don't need to be sorry for anything ever. Its femme fatale is a working mom who is judged for prioritizing her career. Baby, baby, baby. please don't do this. I gotta go. Come on, I got a ton of work to do. Mommy already has a play date with a symphony of antidepressants. Another modern femme fatale mother is Game of Thrones' Cersei Lannister, whose main redeeming quality, we're told, is love for her children. You love your children. It's your one redeeming quality, that and your cheekbones. But far from making her a more generous person, this lioness's ferocious motherly love makes her even deadlier toward everyone else. He poisoned my son, your king. Take him! Science fiction takes on the femme fatale follow on the tradition of the temptress being othered. Under the Skin follows an alien posing as a human woman to pick up men and kill them. Do you want to live? Eh, uh, I why not? Blade Runner and Ex Machina explore femme fatale types who are actually man-made artificial humans. Did you program her to flirt with me? While Blade Runner's Rachel looks the part of the 40s femme fatale, she has human-like feelings for protagonist Deckard. But Ex Machina's Ava, just like Phyllis Dietrichson, only apes those feelings to manipulate a man into helping her get what she wants. I'd like us to go on a date. In the superhero genre, Catwoman is an example where the femme fatale's sexuality is so heightened she's an animal. Again, not quite human. As I was saying, I'm a woman and can't be taken for granted. Life's a bitch, now so am I. 
Horror offers its versions of the trope too, like Jennifer's Body, where Megan Fox's Jennifer becomes a literal man-eater. And now I'm eating your boyfriend. And most recently, the femme fatale can also be used to represent current social issues. Social thriller femme fatale Rose in Get Out represents the sins of the white female racist. Get him, Grandpa. And in Promising Young Woman, Cassie fashions herself as a femme fatale, punishing men for their wrongs against women. I go to a club. I act like I'm too drunk to stand. And every week, a nice guy comes over to see if I'm okay. In classic noir, the femme fatale isn't the protagonist. She's seen through the point of view of a hero whose life she derails. Marvel series Jessica Jones is a modern spin on a noir, or the femme fatale gets to also be the Sam Spade-like P.I. hero. A lot of booze, such a small woman. I don't get asked on a lot of second dates. With classic noir dame looks, Jessica is tragic, self-destructive, and witty. Would you put day drinking under experience or special skills? And like a number of past femme fatales, she's been badly victimized. She's even a superhero, exaggerating the exceptional strength of the old-school femme fatale. But this is her story, interested in her psychology and not how she influences someone else. My greatest weakness. Occasionally, I give a damn. Gone Girl also lets its protagonist femme fatale Amy tell her story and explain why her man deserves to be destroyed. And my lazy, lying, cheating, oblivious husband will go to prison for my murder. The movie chillingly implies that these femme fatale dynamics play into universal gender roles and the hatred that married people feel for each other over time. And then all we did was resent each other and try to control each other and cause each other pain. That's marriage. While Gone Girl sympathizes with its protagonist's grievances, at the same time, the story doesn't vindicate her manipulative and murderous actions. And many of this trope's best examples demonstrate that this fearsome lady remains most potent when she's not declawed, defanged, tamed. You know, there ought to be a law against dames with claws. The Black Widow's danger and poison are important parts of why we continue to be mesmerized, confused, and challenged by this spider woman. I'm poison sweet to myself and everybody around me. The femme fatale illuminates the link that poets have long observed between sex and death. How could I have known that murder can sometimes smell like honeysuckle? You could even read some femme fatales as an embodiment of death itself. Somebody has to die. Why? Somebody always does. Post-World War II noir movies were grappling with the mass death and destruction the world had just experienced. And at times, the femme fatale in these movies seems to personify that darkness still hovering over the world. Don't you see you've only me to make deals with now? I'm building my gallows high, baby. By suddenly entering an apparently normal life and filling it with the shadows of mortality, the femme fatale shocks us awake. And nobody's pulling out. It's straight down the line for both of us. Remember? She forces us to face the basic, deeper truths of our existence, and reminds us that, underneath the artificial, everyday concerns we distract ourselves with, there lurks an abyss we could fall into at any moment. Maybe I'll live so long that I'll forget her. Maybe I'll die trying. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. This video is brought to you by Sundance Now. Whether you're looking for true crime, period pieces, or binge-worthy romances, Sundance Now has it all. One show you can check out on Sundance Now is A Discovery of Witches, starring Matthew Good and Teresa Palmer. The series follows the unlikely alliance between a brilliant witch and a vampire, as their deepening relationship threatens to shake the fragile peace that exists between the species. A Discovery of Witches was named one of Rotten Tomatoes' best shows for 2019. Click the link in our description below, sundancenow.com, to get a free 30-day trial using the promo code THETAKE. Plans start at just $6.99 a month, and you can watch anywhere and cancel anytime. So try it out today!